There are people that will come and say things to you that sound like it is the wisdom of God. It will sound like God is speaking through them and you may be caught because you are not walking in revelation. There are believers who like to subcontract revelation to other people. Pastor, get on your knees and hear what the Lord is saying for me. Prophet of God, there are people who, who have consultants, I call them. Prophetic consultants. You know those prophetic consultants, you will find them on Facebook. Man of God, prophesy over me. I'm not speaking down of the prophets. But you will find that prophets of old, they prophesied for God. They were not prophets for hire. They were not prophetic consultants. Going after, 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 after people's offerings and, and prophesy on demand, no. Who do you think God is that you can demand he prophes- a prophet of God prophesies? Prophesy, man of God. No, go before God and walk in revelation. Walk in revelation. Stop subcontracting your spirituality to someone else. It is your life at the end of the day. This is how people end up being deceived. Praise God. Ask someone next to you, are you happy this morning? Are you happy this morning? Ask, ask, say, are you happy this morning, my brother? And if they say they are not happy, just encourage them. Just speak to someone and say that the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say to them that God has purposed it that you are here this morning because he loves to fellowship with you and he loves you to fellowship with the brethren. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning we want to hear from God. I am a humble vessel that the Lord has elected to speak these words. But I also stand to hear and to be encouraged by God. And we are, sp- we are talking about, I want to share with you about walking in the revelation and the power of revelation knowledge. Unless you've been living under a rock over the last decade or so, you will come or you've come to realize that we are living in extraordinary times. I know every generation, every moment says that about their generation. When there was some kind of social change in the 70s, In the Western world, a lot of people said we are living in an extraordinary times. When we had the 9-11 and the whole terrorism thing in the beginning of the millennium, many people said we are living in extraordinary times. But truly, I believe that we are really living in times that are very strange, very peculiar, and extraordinary times require extraordinary means and God has already provided for us extraordinary means for us to live this life when you listen to what's going on around the world when you're looking at all the rumors of war when you're looking at how people have changed in their morality and ethics when you look at technology and what it's able to do if you look at AI and some of the things that we are seeing machines being able to do we are seeing jobs being lost jobs that we would have never fathomed would be done by a machine are now being done by machines jobs that require reasoning jobs that require some sort of intellect and processing are now being done by machines I don't know if you've been on one of these big company chat Uh, services and you're speaking to someone only to realize that you are speaking to a bot 
and this boat is having a conversation with you. We are living in extraordinary times and these times are times that require extraordinary means. And the Lord spoke to me and said that my people living in this time without having access or without tapping into the extraordinary or what I would call tapping into revelation knowledge are going to struggle but not only to struggle they will not fulfill their mandate. There is no greater failure in this life for a believer to go through life without fulfilling your mandate. And so God is speaking to you saying that he wants you to tap into the extraordinary. He wants you to begin to walk in revelation knowledge. Because no more knowledge and wisdom, human wisdom, will no longer do. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. With me and from verse 12 to 14. I'm reading, reading from the New Living Translation. The Bible says, and we, as we've received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. He says we have received God's spirit so that we can know. God has given us wonderful things. God has made wonderful things available to me, available to you. But he's saying that we have been given the spirit of God so that we can know the wonderful things that have been freely given to us. He says, when we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. When I say that we are living in extraordinary times, these are times that have been foreseen. These are times that have been prophesied. And there is a sense for those who are walking in the spirit, they can make sense of what is going on. And for those that make sense of what is going on, they are then enabled to react and to act accordingly in these times that are extraordinary. But the Bible is saying that those who are not spiritual are not able to receive these truths. Those who are not walking in this revelation are not able to receive these truths. In this world that we're living in today, even in the church, there are some peculiar circumstances that we are facing. Some are facing great challenges in their marriage. And in these challenges, human wisdom, their own wisdom, has not been able to discern what is really going on. There are some who are facing financial difficulties. You have worked hard and you work so hard. In fact, you work harder than the people that you know who seem to be doing well. You try to be financially prudent. You are not lazy, you are up before the sun rises. You are physically exhausted, you are mentally exhausted. And yet, there seem to be a problem with your advancement. You are looking at some other people who don't even work half as much as you work. And yet, they seem to be doing well in life. There are some parents who have done everything right. They've read the word of God. Train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. You have tried your best. You have trained up your child. Yes, you've made mistakes, but you can stand before God like David did and say that I've been a righteous man. You can say that, Lord, I've tried my best, and yet your grown-up children seem to have walked away from God and are not turning back to God. 
And you say, Lord, I, I spent time with them. I provided. We read the word of God. We prayed. I pray. I fast. What is going on? Others are facing challenges in their workplace. You name it, whatever it is you're going through. And you've tried your humanly wisdom to fight against certain things. And it's not working. I have a message for you this morning. That God is saying that some of these things, the solution is only found for those that are walking in the spirit. It is very easy for you to become a Sunday Christian. You do everything that is asked of you, but you're not walking in the spirit. It is possible for you to be someone that has never missed a meeting, a gathering with a brethren. You, you give your offerings, you give your tithes, you, you do everything that you've been taught to do. And yet, you are among the people that do not walk in revelation. Who do not walk in revelation knowledge? God has sent me to say to you today, that he is calling you to begin to walk in revelation knowledge. There are things that he wants to share with you about your life. There are things he wants to share with you about the life of the people around you. There are things that he wants to open your eyes to in your office, in your generation, in your extended family. There are things that he wants to reveal to you that are going on inside of yourself. And as he reveals these things to you, he wants to give you even a way to combat and eradicate these things in your life. Hallelujah. And so this message this morning is a message of hope. And I know that there are many here and those listening that need to hear this. My brother, our life in God he did not design it to be the struggle that you're going through. It is not a struggle the way you understand it. Hear me well. I'm not saying there will not be struggles, but I'm not saying it's not the struggle the way you are struggling. For he has given us his spirit that knows everything, that knows the mind of God, that knows the hearts of men and women. And he was sent to come and to become your friend, to become your counselor, to walk next to you and whisper in your spirit and say that what's happening there is because of X, Y, Z. Let us go this way. Let us do this. Don't respond to that. Respond to that. But many are not hearing and they're acting according to our own knowledge. There are two kinds of knowledge in this world. There is what I would call sense knowledge or human knowledge. And there is what we're speaking about, that is revealed knowledge. Sense knowledge or natural knowledge or human knowledge is gained through the five physical senses. This is knowledge that you gain from what you hear. It is what you gain from what you see with your eyes, from what you taste, from what you touch, from what you smell. It is the kind of knowledge that you learn in school. Tamara was giving testimony of how God has helped her in her schooling and she is using that knowledge that has been gained from school. It is human knowledge. And this knowledge, there are people that have gained so much of it, that have PhDs upon PhDs. There are those that are called wise, those that have been lined up for Nobel Peace Prizes, in science and engineering and all sorts, and they are called the wise of this age. But that knowledge is limited and it is simply humanistic. It is not revealed. This kind of knowledge is received from the outside in. And this knowledge is the kind of knowledge that you need to deal with certain things, but that will become useless when you are dealing with the real issues of life. 
And many of us here were dealing with real issues of life. There are issues of, of decisions that we need to make that are going to affect our lives. There are Nobel Peace Prize winners that cannot raise their children, whose children have gone wayward. They have gone and, and, and looked in their received knowledge, in their, the knowledge that they have gained from their books, but nothing seems to be saying to them how to deal with their children. Nothing seems to be saying to these people that are economic geniuses how to deal with the situation in their marriage. In fact, there are doctors and, and scientists who have gone into laboratories and come up with medicines and, 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 and vaccines and all sorts of things and they can put machines in your body. These machines can see all things that are happening and yet they cannot heal themselves. They die of the same diseases that they are helping others to be healed from. And yet there was a man who did not go to any university. His name was Yeshua. And he was able to lay hands on the blind and their eyes were opened. He did not go to a university to study how the eyes work, but he was full of revealed knowledge. He sat amongst the wise and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and they would ask him questions, learned questions, questions to trap him. And he would not hear what they're asking but hear what they're really thinking. That is revealed knowledge. There are people in this world who are living among us who are walking in revelation knowledge. And God is able to let them know and give them insight into some of the things that are really happening. And some of these people, you may not see them because they are not standing here speaking before you, but they are living victorious lives. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Paul says to these brethren, we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. And he says, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. The Greek word that he uses here to speak about knowledge is the word epignosis. And epignosis speaks of complete, exact, full knowledge. Epignosis is is full, complete knowledge that is lacking nothing. And this is revealed knowledge. Paul is saying that we pray that God will give you a revelation of his will. And this revelation will give you wisdom and you will know how to act and to face the things which are coming in front of you. Because man's knowledge is fallible. I don't know how many of you, perhaps it's just me, but I know some of you have been in situations where you are speaking to someone. You have tried to express yourself, but they misunderstand you. How many people here have been misunderstood? You have tried to express something and you have been misunderstood. Many times we misunderstand people. Someone has tried to share something with you has tried to explain something to you, but you misunderstand. That is because the knowledge that they are trying to pass to you, it is fallible. It is full of falsehoods. Not intentional, but it is just the nature of the life that we are living. We don't possess the fullness of knowledge. When I come and say something to you, I am limited to what I know. In fact, when I'm trying to explain something to you, I'm limited to the context that I'm in. And so I can come and speak to you. And I can speak to you according to what I understand in my context. But because you're in a different context, you don't understand me in the way that I mean for you to understand me. And that can give birth to conflict. It can give birth to strife. Marriages have broken down because of lack of understanding. Businesses have collapsed because of lack of understanding. But God is saying that there is a knowledge that is wholesome, 
that is infallible that he wants you to walk in. Hallelujah. And there are a number of things that we see through this revelation knowledge. Number one is that faith is key. In order for you to walk in revelation knowledge, you must have faith. You must have faith. You know, God can speak to you and give you revelation, but you will not receive it because of your lack of faith. Because you don't have faith, because you have not fully submitted yourself into understanding who God is and giving your life completely to him, and that is faith. Faith is obedience. Then you can miss revelation. Let us read in Luke chapter 1. From verse 5, very quickly, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the, land, all the Lord's commandments and regulations. You see that? He is among the people I was talking about who do everything that has been asked of them. He was a priest. The Bible says that they had been careful. They were righteous in God's eyes and had been careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving God in a temple for his order was uh, on duty that week and it was the custom of the priests. He was chosen by a lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. When in the incense, while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. This is like what we're doing here. We have come here to burn incense. And watch what God does when people come in. He starts to speak to them. He starts to reveal things to them. Sometimes it is through direct communication. It could be through the message. It could be through the brethren here. Someone can say something and that will be God using them to speak a word of revelation. But if you are not in faith, then you will miss it. Zechariah is in the sanctuary. He is burning incense. And as people were there, they are standing there. Zechariah is in the sanctuary. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, verse 11, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy, with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers of the, to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. This is revelation knowledge being given to Zechariah. He is being given an insight into something that no man, no woman could give him, could tell him. But listen to what he says. He says, how can I be sure this will happen? The Lord appears to uh, Zechariah. He sends his angel to Zechariah. He speaks to Zechariah. Zechariah accepts and, and, and realizes he is being spoken to by a servant of God. Just like many of us here, it's not that we doubt God, we know God, we come to church, we do the things that are required of us. But there is something that was missing in Zechariah, which by God's grace, his wife Elizabeth had. And that is faith. That is faith. You see, lack of faith here, he says, how can I be sure this will happen? The Bible says that faith is believing in the things that you cannot be sure of because you have not seen them. You have not seen them. He has spoken to you. He has said that he's going to take you here. And you are asking God, how can I be sure? 
And what God is saying to you that you don't need to, you just trust me. You just need to be sure that I am the Lord. He says all you need to do is stop just singing ah, 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 Adonai. But believe that I am Adonai. That we don't just go through the motions, lift our hands, meet together, and yet inside we have not submitted our doubt and our unbelief to God. He is saying, my brother, my sister, he is saying to you, submit your fear. Submit your unbelief. Submit your need to be sure. You've been so organized in your, in your life. You've been so diligent that now your diligence is standing in the way. Your you built up, a, uh, your life has been about being sure. You've been financially prudent since you were a young man, since you were a young woman, that you put your money aside, that you're never caught unawares by the bills. You are not one to just go and spend on takeaways and spend on the things that you don't have, on the things that you cannot afford. You buy vehicles that you can afford, you do all the right things. And now God comes and says to you, something will happen and because you cannot see it in your savings account, because it is outside of your control, now you say, Lord, are you sure? How can I be sure? How can I be sure? Because I'm used to being sure. Zachariah was used to being sure. He said, how can I be sure that this will happen? Then he, he begins to educate God, like we do sometimes. He says to the angel, <laughs> he says to him, take this message back to God, that I am an old man, and my wife is also well along in years. With all due respect, we say to God sometimes, with all due respect, Lord, I don't think you can do this. Because I just can't see it. With all due respect, Lord, I, I, I really trust and believe in you on, on the things that I can see. But on this one, Lord, I want to remind you that my time has gone past. The things you are saying to me are the things of young men and young women. Lord, I want to remind you of how many bills and financial responsibilities I have. Lord, you forgot that I look after my family back home. Have you forgotten? Lord, you're asking me to do this, yet let me remind you, Lord. Let me remind you. It's like Moses. God says you will go and speak and stand. Moses says, Lord, may I remind you that I, can't, I struggle to speak. He says to Gideon, Gideon says, may I remind you that I'm just, I'm just from a small tribe. Zachariah said, Lord, I'm not sure if you, if, <laughs> I'm not sure if you realize, but I'm an old man and my wife is an old woman. And um, the angel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But listen, he says, but now since you didn't believe what I said, since you felt that in your fallible wisdom, in your human wisdom, the one where you used your eyes to see your wife and her age, the one where you used your feelings to feel your body, since you decided not to believe, since you decided to challenge revelation with your man-made wisdom, with your man, with your, con with your conceptions, then you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. You know, God knew that this boy, John, he was such a powerful man. And God knew that we are saboteurs. 
sometimes of what God is planning to do. When God has given you revelation, sometimes you end up sabotaging it by your unbelief. And he said to, uh, to Zechariah, I will now shut your mouth because at least your wife has faith. At least Elizabeth has faith and has revelation. Hallelujah. And we continue to read there and we see what happens. Now I want us to go over to Elizabeth, verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came to the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zachariah. But the woman of Revelation said, absolutely not. His name is John. This is a woman who was walking in revelation knowledge. These people, they wanted to name this boy after his father, Zachariah. And it may have made a lot of sense culturally, and it was wisdom, and it was, you know, Zachariah is an old man. And God has blessed him finally. His wife is an old woman. God has blessed her finally. The wise and the good and the, and the noble came and said, now let us name the child after his father. For God has been good. There are people that will come and say things to you that sound like it is the wisdom of God. It will sound like God is speaking through them and you may be caught because you are not walking in revelation. There are believers who like to subcontract revelation to other people pastor get on your knees and hear what the Lord is saying for me prophet of God there are people who who have consultants I call them prophetic consultants you know those prophetic consultants you will find them on Facebook man of God prophesy over me I'm not speaking down of the prophets but you will find that prophets of old they prophesied for God they were not prophets for hire they were not prophetic consultants going after after, after, after people's offerings and, and prophesy on demand no who do you think God is that you can demand he prophet, a prophet of God prophesies. Prophesy, man of God. No, go before God and walk in revelation. Walk in revelation. Stop subcontracting your spirituality to someone else. It is your life at the end of the day. This is how people end up being deceived by men of God and women of God who have fallen, who are no longer walking in revelation. And they begin to speak what is not of God, like these people. Call him Zachariah. The woman said, absolutely not. They turned around to Zachariah, but he was mute. He couldn't contribute. He couldn't contribute. You know the Lord knows. Sometimes he will just shut some people down. So they say, Elizabeth, first of all, this is things that, why are you involved? It is, the, it is we, we named the child. You are just a woman, you know how those societies worked. She said, no, his name is John. They look at Zachariah, mm, I have nothing to say. I can't say, I cannot get in the way. And so they name him John, hallelujah. She said, no, he said, his name shall be John. You think I'm, I'm making this up? It says they, they used gestures to ask the baby father what he wanted to name him. He couldn't say anything. So he said, okay, bring a tablet. And to everyone's surprise, he wrote his name is John. Now he realizes that we must walk in this revelation. You see that the problem is now Zachariah is believing after he has seen. And sometimes it's too late. He is believing. Now he's saying, bring a tablet. Elizabeth has already said it. She knew it. And you, Zachariah, you heard it even before. But you did not believe. God is saying to you that will you believe when he speaks? And so that you can be trained 
to become a man and a woman of revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But praise God for his mercy when Zechariah aligned himself to the will of God, even though it was after he had seen, then he was able to speak. He was able to speak. Hallelujah. Walking in revelation is so important for your life because you will miss God moments if you're not walking in revelation. Do you understand what I mean by God moments? There are moments that take place in your life that are so significant to the rest of your life that you cannot afford to miss them. By a show of hands, how many of you have had God moments? How many of you have experienced supernatural moments where something was spoken, where you saw something, when you received something, and it completely changed the trajectory of your life? It completely made you understand and aware what God wants you to do. Last week we asked, I believe it was last week, if there is anybody that does not know what it is that God has purpose for them. And I still extend that, pray and say, Lord, I need to know my call. I need to know my purpose. Your life will make sense when you know your purpose. Some of the struggles that you've been through will make sense when you know what God has called you to. You'll be like, oh, is that why I went through that? Is that why I went through that pain? So God wanted me to understand how certain people feel. And those who have not gone through it just cannot understand. If you've been able, if you've been ministered to by somebody who's been heartbroken in their life, you will know when they're praying for you that they understand. They will not dismiss you. When you are praying with someone who has lost a parent and you've been through the pain of losing a parent, you will know that it is not just prayer they need. That they need support. Ongoing support. You will know that times will come where they will be overwhelmed with emotion. You know when you see those young ministers like me saying to people who have teenagers, do this, do this, do that. You are going wrong here and there. And some of them will look at people like me and say, okay, <laughs> yours are still young. Wait till they're teenagers. But when you have somebody ministering to you who has had teenagers, who has fought that fight, not these teenagers here, these are wonderful ones, they are the other ones out there, who has fought that fight and has been victorious, they will have empathy. When you are speaking to them and say, I'm praying with my son, but he is completely ignoring me, they will not say to you that your prayer is not strong enough. They will say to you that it is, I understand, but this is how we fight. This is how we continue. Hallelujah. So you must know your calling. You must know your vision. You must know your mission. And your life will make sense. And if you miss your God moments, you may miss the moment where you, you will know. The divine moments in life. Luke chapter 2. We're continuing in Luke. Verse 25, at the time there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and he had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the Lord required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God. This man had been waiting all his life and listened to what the Bible said. The spirit, that day, the spirit led him to the temple. This man was walking in the spirit and because he was walking in the spirit, he received the revelation knowledge. There are certain people who are not in church today because they are not walking in revelation knowledge. And there are some of you who have been prompted, go, 
there is something for you. There is somebody you need to meet. There are people who just turn up to places. You ask them, what have you come to do? They don't know, but they're walking in revelation knowledge. God has just prompted them, go. There are business opportunities that have come about that way. There are marriages that have come about that way. There is healing that has been received that way. Because someone is walking in the spirit and the spirit says, go. And they have learned not to question and ask, Lord, I have no business there. They will pack their bags, they will go. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Spirit said, go, you know that there is a mandate for you there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I pray that you do not miss your God moment. I pray that you do not miss your divine moment. Because you are stuck somewhere doing things with your earthly wisdom. I pray that you do not miss your divine moment because you misunderstood someone. I pray that you do not miss your divine moment because you look down on someone. Someone who could have been the key to your success. You looked at them and you said, they, they can't do for me. But I pray that the Lord will cause you to walk in revelation knowledge. Hallelujah. Amen. Keeping revelation alive is another key for you to continue living in the spirit. And this is by your testimony and experience with God. It's by keeping your testimony and your experiences with God alive. Remembering what God has done and storing these things in your spirit. Storing these experiences and meditating upon them it can cause you to have a revelation of God is. And when you have a revelation of who God is, you will not miss the revelation knowledge that God pours out on you. Hallelujah. Again, in the same chapter, Luke 21, uh, chapter 2, verse 51. Then he returned to Nazareth with them, and he was obedient with them. This is Jesus. He's speaking about when Mary and Joseph, they, they lost their son. And they couldn't find him for two days. And they went and found him. He was in a temple. He was speaking and discussing the word of God with the learned people. And everyone was amazed. And so when they returned to Jerusalem, to Nazareth with him, he was obedient with them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Mary was observing Jesus. And she was storing the revelation. She was storing her experiences in her heart. That's what the Bible says. She was storing in her heart from when he was a child, when he is sitting with his old men and women and he's discussing the word of God with them and they are being amazed and he's speaking things that even the learned cannot comprehend. Mary was keeping all these things. You know, he went and said to her, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I would be here? He, she was perplexed. She kept it in her heart. And guess what? The first miracle that is recorded of Jesus doing, what did Mary do? She had revelation knowledge. Where did she get it from? She had kept the experiences and testimonies and revelation in her heart. She meditated on them. And so when wine ran out of this wedding, and it was a time for Jesus to perform his first miracle, she was involved. She was so confident. She said, just go and call Jesus. Why? Because she has stored the revelation and testimonies in her heart. And she had meditated upon these things. She kept them in her heart. Are you somebody who has not kept? You forgot what God did. And every time you're facing a challenge, it's like you're starting from, from zero. Because you are not meditating and remembering what it is that God has done for you. Why don't you create a system in your life where on, on occasionally, regularly, you go back with your spouse, with your children, with yourself and remember and regurgitate and, 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 and say that this is what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. You know that song, look what the Lord has done. What we've been waiting for. 
has come to pass. Look what the Lord has done. We were, I was in a naming ceremony yesterday of our brother and sister, and they were playing that song. And it was beautiful because in that moment, God had done something. And I pray that they continue remembering what God has done. Do you remember what he did for you? The Israelites, they did not walk in revelation because they forgot everything God did. They forgot what God did, the miracles. The enemy, his job is to steal. He wants to steal your cash. C-A-C-H-E. Your cash of testimonies and experiences. And how does he steal them? By other circumstances that are coming. By the people speaking into you. By social media. By Netflix. As you are, in, as you are consuming a lot of these things that kill faith. You are losing that remembrance of the things that God has done. But Mary, the Bible says, she stored all these things in her heart. She meditated upon these things in her heart. May I ask you, by the mercies of God, to begin to write down the things God has done for you. May I ask you and plead with you by the mercies of God to begin to take time intentionally as part of your worship to remember what God did for you. Say, Lord, I thank you because that time I was facing eviction and you came through for me. And then you are, next time again you remember. Next time, next time you face such a problem, you will just speak. And you will know that God will do it for you because he can do it. Hallelujah. She kept all these things close to her heart. She meditated on it. Hallelujah. She had confidence. Amen. Walking in revelation demands that you ignore present difficulties. I'm just sharing with you what the Lord was downloading in me. And I just pray that one of these things will capture you and you will run with it. Walking in revelation demands that you ignore present realities. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 16 the Bible says that is why we never give up Paul is saying to the Corinthians though our bodies are dying our spirits are being renewed every day he says for our present troubles are small and won't last very long yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs the men will last forever so we don't look at the troubles we can see now Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. We do not fix our gaze on the troubles that we see now, but we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. God is calling upon you to fix your gaze on the promises that he has made and not what you are seeing right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will somebody just pray with me in this moment? In this moment, if this is you, say, Lord, I take my eyes off my present troubles. They are so real. They are so real. I feel them. I see them. I taste them. I can touch them. But I take my eyes off them. And I set my gaze on the things. I set my gaze on the things that I cannot see, but I know them to be as real as the things that I see. I set my gaze on the things that I cannot see, but I know they're as real as the things that I see. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, he will never contradict himself. And so ask God to give you that faith for you to be able to see beyond what you are seeing, what is in front of you right now. Hallelujah. Come on, this is for somebody. You are literally, you are just staring at your troubles 
And the more you stare at them, the bigger they are becoming. It is affecting your mental health. You are depressed. You are anxious. You are finding yourself having these, these anxiety attacks. You are focusing on the trouble that is ahead of you. It is real. I'm not saying it is not real. It is right there. But he is saying to you, take your gaze off them. How do you do that, you ask? How do I take my gaze? I'm facing a very real situation in front of me, Pastor. Your logic says, Pastor, if, if I don't deal with this, is it not negligence? Am I not being negligent if I don't deal with this thing right in front of me? But the Lord is saying to somebody here, that lay down, that is not negligence. Because if there's nothing that you can do about the situation, just leave it to me. And set your gaze on my word. Revive your prayer life. These troubles that we are facing right now, their job, their purpose is to destroy your prayer life. You don't know how many people I speak to who say, Pastor, I can't pray anymore. I can't pray anymore. I've, I've, I've given up. It's too much. You pray for me. I want to encourage you. Pray. Come before God just as you are and begin to revive your prayer life. Those situations have been sent to destroy your prayer life so that you can keep on gazing at them. But he's saying revive your prayer life. Begin today. Be intentional about setting time to go before the Lord. Do your crying before God, not before your problems. Do your complaining before God, not before your problems. Go and be weak before God, not before your problems. He is there with his arms wide open. He says, come. You know, you are thinking that you need to get yourself right. You need to get yourself sorted. He says to you, do you think I don't see you the way you are? Do you think that I don't see what you are thinking, how you are feeling? Why do you feel that you will revive your prayer life when you feel that you, you deserve to be in my prayer? He says, come just as you are. Today, right now. Your prayer life may be dead, but just come before me. Be intentional. And just say, Father, here I am. Here I am, God. I need to walk in revelation knowledge. Father, I've been doing this thing by myself. I've been trying to use my wisdom. I've been trying to argue using my knowledge and my logic. But it's not working. In fact, it is making the situation worse. I come before you, Father God, just as I am, and I surrender myself to you. I am arrested in your presence. I am arrested in your presence. Yes, come to him with your addictions. Oh yes, he sees you doing what you are doing. He is not blind to it, but he says, come, come. I am ready to free you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not logic. It is not about longevity. It is not about how long you've been walking with the Lord. Some of us, we think that because we've been walking with the Lord for 10, 15, 20 years, we are walking in revelation knowledge. No, it is not a matter of longevity. It is a matter of being constant in his presence. Hallelujah. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, we read about a man called Itai. And Itai comes around David at the time where Absalom decides to try and do a coup on his father. 
Absalom, there is a spirit that we call the Absalomic spirit. It is prevalent even in churches. Absalom is trying to make the people of Israel feel that his father is not doing a good job. The king is not doing a good job. I pray that we don't have an Absalomic spirit among us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He is going to the people who cannot be, who cannot see the king, who, who, whose, whose problems cannot be solved. And he says to them, this, if I was your king, things would be better. And so he arranges to do a coup on David. And so David learns about this and he runs away. And Absalom is declared king. And a man called Itai, he turns up and he comes to David because he recognizes that David is the real king. He has that revelation. David discourages him and says, look, you're new. Just go to Absalom, no problem. But this one says, no, I know you are the king. I have my revelation. In contrast, look at one of David's uh, um, uh, advisors. One of, what's his name? Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's advisor for a long time. But when he saw that the kingdom was being overturned, when he saw that David was about to lose or had lost the kingdom, he went and followed Absalom. He went and followed Absalom. He lacked revelation. This is a man who had walked with David. I'm saying to you, it is not a matter of how long you've been a Christian. You can have been a Christian for 10, 20 years, and yet you are not walking in revelation. But Itai, he was new, but he just had, he just knew this one is the king. I'm not going to follow Absalom. And guess where Itai goes? Itai, uh, uh, this guy, Ahithophel, he goes over to Absalom and says, I can be your counselor. He was an advisor to David. He now goes over to Absalom and offers his services. And Absalom says, because you are a wise advisor to my father, I'm going to make you my advisor. Be very careful taking advice from husbands. This is what I'm talking about, consulting prophets who you don't live with. Just because someone looks like they're doing miracles and performing miracles on YouTube doesn't mean that you need to pick up the phone and get them to speak into your life. God has placed prophets among you. The Spirit of God is here. You don't need to go across the world to hear what God is saying. Absalom, because of what Ahithophel had been, he said that he would still give me advice. But he was wrong. I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters. The, the word of God says to us that we will know those who are of God by their fruit. That includes the prophets and the pastors and the apostles and the teachers and the evangelists and the counselors. You must observe their fruit. Do not let me stand here and say I'm your pastor and preach if you don't see the fruit of the Spirit in me. If my lifestyle is completely different from what I preach, do not listen to what I have to say. You must know them by their fruit. And I warn people, you do not know the fruit of some of the people you're taking advice from. You do not know the fruit of some of the people you're running to to speak into your situation. Perhaps here your pastor has said no, so you run to find a prophet to say yes. And you've seen YouTube miracles. You've seen drama on YouTube and now you are running. I warn you, God is speaking to his church. Why he has created the body of Christ and has formed servants of God and elders for his people and ministers is because he knows that he needs to speak to people in a fellowship and he needs the fellowship to observe and see the fruit. 
We are responsible for one another. You observe my fruit, and I speak to you from God. Hallelujah. But above that, you walk in your own revelation knowledge. And let the servants of God affirm and confirm what the Lord is saying to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because the servants of the Lord will get it wrong sometimes. And you will not go and claim ignorance before God. He will say to you, I poured out my spirit. Hallelujah. We began with Paul saying to the Corinthians, he says that we speak words given to us by the spirit. Using the spirit words to explain spiritual truths. And this spirit has been given and poured out to all of us. Hallelujah. I want to pray that today your life changes and you begin to walk in revelation knowledge. And for those of us, if you are already walking in revelation knowledge, I pray that God will strengthen your faith. That when you receive revelation, your, unf- your lack of faith <laughs> will not cause you to miss the fruit of this revelation. Hallelujah. And for those who are walking in revelation, that you'll be obedient to God, that you do not miss the divine moments of when God says, go, and you go. Even if it is against the grain, against the grain you go. Even if it is uncomfortable, you go. The Lord says, go. He says, stay, you stay. Even if it is against what you are used to, you stay. Because we are under the subjection of our God. Hallelujah. He directs our path. Hallelujah. And I pray that the Lord will use you to continue to meditate upon the, what he has done in your life. For you to remember the works of the Lord. And that this will strengthen your faith. And you'll be able to walk in revelation because you know who God is. Hallelujah. I pray for you as I pray for myself that you will learn to ignore present realities and walk in the revelation of what God says even if you cannot see it with your physical eyes. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hi everybody, we just want to welcome you to our different activities which happen here in Fountain Church. On Monday we have our men's fellowship which happen here at 6.30. On Tuesday we've got the intercession which also happen here at 6.30. Wednesday Bible study we meet online on Zoom. And on Friday we have the young people connected meeting at 6.30 and the women in power at 7. And inspire all the young people in this church. Uh, They meet every two weeks. So we can't wait to see you there. God bless you and you have a lovely day.